Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 63. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and it's great to have your company. Before we dive into this week's episode, I'd like to thank the wonderful patrons who continue to support this podcast and welcome patrons who joined the Talking Tudors family in January. A warm welcome to Sanchez, Rebecca, Marie, Jess, and Sarah. I'm so grateful for your generosity. If you love Talking Tutors and would like to show your appreciation and support the work I do, just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetutortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tutors patron family and you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. February's prize is a copy of Uncrowned Queen, The Fateful Life of Margaret Beaufort, Tudor Matriarch by Dr. Nicola Tallis. Thank you to Michael O'Mara Books for sponsoring this wonderful prize. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show today are Peter Sayer and Alan Sharpington. Pete and Alan are the Education Officers at the Golden Hind, a full-scale and fully operational reconstruction of Sir Francis Drake's iconic ship. Just like the original, the reconstruction has circumnavigated the world and now serves as a museum on the south bank of the River Thames in London. Pete and Alan both come from a background in history, heritage, education and theatre, and are passionate about bringing the story of Drake and his crew to life. They've spent the past year and a half delving into Elizabethan maritime history and getting to know what life might have been like on the cramped decks of a 16th century galleon. My conversation with Pete and Alan straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. Back to another episode of Talking Tudors. Now, on today's show, I'll be chatting with two guests, Pete Sayer and Alan Sharpington from The Golden Hind. Welcome, Pete and Alan, to Talking Tudors. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Thanks very much for having us. Now, let's begin with some introductions. So, Pete, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm one of the education officers at The Golden Hind. Um, which for those of you who don't know is a a ship museum in London. My primary focus there is on their secondary school education programs uh, and and their public engagement as well. I have a history undergraduate degree. Uh, My dissertation was in the self-fashioning of early modern European seafarers, uh, so focusing particularly on pirates and privateers, which is how I ended up at the museum. And I'm currently working on a master's in museum studies at Birkbeck College in the University of London. Fabulous. And Alan, your turn. Please introduce yourself. 
Sure, yeah. So uh, I am also an education officer on the program uh, on the Golden Hind. My main focuses are primary school programs and uh, public programs, so family programs. Uh, my background was in theatre, so I used to run a theatre company, actor, writer, director. During a, a period of uh, rest, as actors call it, I took a job doing some work in a school. Uh, and then I ended up doing science in schools, running after school clubs and things like that and becoming writing educational programs. And then um, during another period of rest, <laughs> the Golden Hind were advertising for, uh, for education officers and here I am. Fabulous. All right. Let's 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 talk about the Golden Hind. So it's a full scale and fully operational reconstruction, as you said, of Sir Francis Drake's ship. Now, for our listeners, maybe who haven't had a chance to see any pics of it yet or don't have much info. Pete, can you tell us a little bit about what it looks like and what it was like? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're tucked just around the corner from London Bridge um, in a dry dock. Uh, and if you can conjure up the image of a romantic or romanticised pirate ship, uh, you're kind of on the right track. We're a five-decked, three-mastered, 120-ton race-built galleon with a nice big golden hind as our figurehead. Uh, the main thing that people say, actually, when they when they first come aboard or when they first see the ship, uh, is that they remark on how small the ship actually is for a ship that circumnavigated the world with a crew of nearly 80 men. Very, very low, especially on uh, on the gun deck where many of the crew would have would have lived. It's only three and a half feet high in places so when you visit the ship you will be crawling around uh, a lot of the time okay yeah i think I, I i have seen it i haven't been on board but i i think it's quite near to Suffolk cathedral isn't it that's right yes you can see the cathedral from uh, from the foredeck yeah i remember seeing it well next time i'm there i'll have to come and say hello to you both you should come um, and say hi absolutely <laughs> yeah. So before we talk more about the the famous circumnavigation, it would be really great if you could tell us a little bit more about Francis Drake. So, Alan, who was he and when did his love of the sea begin? He was born sometime in the early 1540s. We're not exactly sure when. Uh, Tudors had the rather irksome habit of recording um, deaths and marriages and baptisms, but not births. So we think around about 1540 to 1542. And he was born in uh, Tavistock in the West Country of England. Uh, lots and lots of ports, very, very seafaring down there. And he was the eldest of 12 brothers. Now, supposedly due to post-Reformation religious persecution, his father was a Protestant. Uh, his family fled to Kent in the late 1540s. But there is, however, a parallel story that his father stole a horse, punched someone and then went on the run. So you kind of have to take your pick of which of those two stories you want to believe. Catholic insurgencies were really, really common at the time. It was a very unstable, insecure country. So either of those stories or maybe both of those stories are true. So they ended up initially living in the hull of an abandoned ship on the Medway, which is a, a river in Kent. And Drake's father, who's, uh, whose name was Edmund, uh, he started preaching at the local docks uh, and eventually he was uh, given a church in which to work uh, on the Medway uh, and he apprenticed the young Francis Drake out to his neighbour. His neighbour was a, an elderly merchant who sailed a bark to and from France, transporting merchandise essentially. And when the neighbour died, he was unmarried, he was childless and uh, young Francis Drake inherited the vessel. Uh, in his late teens, he moved back to the West Country and he joined his uh, second cousin, the wealthy side of the Drake family, a guy called John Hawkins, and Drake joined him as a purser. From here, he sailed to uh, Europe, Africa, and eventually they started transatlantic crossings to the Americas. And having been almost killed by the Spanish in a, in a deal gone horribly wrong off the coast of Mexico, uh, his lifelong rivalry with, with the Spanish began right there. Okay, and so a lot of our listeners probably know that um, the Golden Hind, captained by Sir Francis Drake, was the first English ship to circumnavigate the globe between 1577 and 1580. So, Pete, can you talk to us about this this journey? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I'm sure a lot of your visitors know as well, the world obviously was a very different place in 1577. Um, you've got Spain, who are kind of a global superpower in this period. They've got vast territories, particularly in what they're calling the New World, um, over in the Americas. Uh, and in one of their territories over there, the Viceroyalty of Peru, they've been mining tons and tons of silver, which is was having an impact all over the world, actually. Um, third bit ends up in, in China and causes some inflation over there. Um, lion's share ends up in Europe, of course. And it begins to be noticed by English pirates, effectively pirates and, and privateers who are sailing over to the New World, sort of creaming some of that wealth wealth off the top uh, and bringing it back to England, either for their benefit or the benefit of their sponsors. Um, and one of these men is is called Francis Drake, and um, 
he has been collecting money over in the New World. He comes to the attention of Queen Elizabeth I herself, and the two of them uh, come up with an idea, which is that rather than sail over to the Caribbean, which is what a lot of these pirates and privateers have been doing, Drake is going to sail into the Pacific and raid along the Pacific coast of the Spanish Empire, supposedly easier, it's a little bit more undefended. Um, He's going to make traffic for England, encourage trade, find new territories, and also there's the implicit understanding that he's going to be um, stealing Spanish goods as well. The plan at this stage, we think, is that he will return home by sailing Uh, by discovering what he calls the Straits of Anian, or the Northwest Passage. And this is an undiscovered route that supposedly runs over the top of the Americas and back down into Europe. So it's not necessarily the intention to circumnavigate the world at this point. So Drake does set sail, kind of a cold November morning, sort of about five o'clock, off he goes. And the first month is a bit of a disaster, actually. He doesn't get much further than than Cornwall before he's forced to turn back um, and make repairs on some of his ships. There's fierce storms in the Channel. And a month later, a little bit more embarrassed, Drake sets off again. His first stop is just off the coast of continental Africa. um, And then he crosses over the Atlantic, having raided some Portuguese ships, sails down the coast, um, the the Atlantic coast of the Americas, and then through a very dangerous stretch called the Straits of Magellan, uh, which is a very narrow passage that runs between Tierra de Fuego and uh, and the south of the Americas. It's named after the first circumnavigator of the world, Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, As he goes through this stretch, they're forced to scupper a couple of the ships for supplies. Um, Coming out the other side, one of them strikes a rock and sinks and loses all hands. Two of the ships then get separated and one then returns to England. So you end up with a situation where it's just Drake, the Golden Hind. And we think a crew of around 80 men um, in the Pacific Ocean. They're blown a few hundred miles south by a storm um, before managing to turn north. And then they raid all the way along the Pacific coast. So their first stop is a town called Valparaiso. It's a small Spanish town. It's relatively undefended. And they're caught by surprise. They actually send out a drum boat to drum the Golden Hind salute as it arrives into port, thinking that it's a Spanish ship. So when the Golden Hind attacks, they surrender almost immediately. And that's sort of a pattern that follows Drake all the way along the coast. He catches towns unawares. And eventually he captures a Spanish treasure ship. It's called Nuestra Señora de la Concepción which has tons and tons of silver in its hold. And then with the ship laden with treasure, he sails north and he tries to get through this northwest passage, but he can't find it. And there are reports of it getting so cold aboard the ship that things start to freeze. So he's forced to turn south. um, And then he lands somewhere, we think, in modern day California. We're not sure exactly where. And wherever it is, he says he puts a plaque down that says Nova Albion or New England. So he claims the land for Queen Elizabeth. Um, And then aware that the Spanish are waiting for him in the south, he nips across the Pacific Ocean, takes him 68 days to reach the Spice Islands, where he trades with a king in the Spice Islands, a man called the Sultan of Ternate, and then sets off again through the Indian Ocean, round the Cape and back to England. Wow, what an incredible adventure. Why haven't we seen a feature film about all that yet? (laughs) (laughs) We're working on it. We're working on it. You're working on it. Okay, good. (laughs) Sounds great. Now... You mentioned before that obviously the ship is it's not very spacious. So I'd love to know, Alan, what was li- life like on board a 16th century galleon? Well, that's a, that's an excellent question. The design of a, a race-built galleon uh, such as the Golden Hind incorporates not only very uh, low uh, deck heads, low ceilings, but also very narrow decks. So this means a lower centre of gravity, and this allows for superior speed and manoeuvrability uh, than many other ships of the time. Top speed was a whopping seven knots, which translates to just over about eight miles an hour. Uh, And so the average speed is closer to about three knots. So as you can imagine, going uh, doing a a journey that's been estimated at around 35,000 miles, uh, speed of about four miles an hour is uh, is pretty, pretty much uh, pretty much a claustrophobic experience, I imagine. Uh, If you add to this the roll from side to side of around 40 degrees in either direction and pitching through the waves at about the same angle, Uh, It's a fairly terrifying experience just keeping the ship under control, I think. One of the sailors from the 1980s actually told us it was like trying to sit on a bobbing cork. The majority of the crew, of course, they were highly experienced. They were well-drilled mariners. They were used to working these chaotic conditions. Uh, Drake actually had a lot of crew that followed him from ship to ship. And uh, that continuity would be a a really important factor in the organisation. The organisation was really absolutely key to, uh, to how a ship would work. Well, your personal experience really depended on who you were, of course, who, where you were in the chain of command. So with the captain at the top, of course, uh, he is literally and uh, uh, he's, he has a cabin right at the top because he needs to be 
in terms of status, higher than everyone else. He also needs to be uh, closer to God. And uh, his position as captain was completely unquestionable and uh, motivated, of course, by profoundly religious beliefs. Drake believed that as the Queen was appointed by God and he by the Queen, uh, then he was by proxy an appointment from heaven. They would quite often have seven or eight sermons a day on board the ship, and Drake was uh, not averse to shoving the chaplain out of the way and sermonising to the crew <laughs> himself. Um, officers were, broadly speaking, educated men, wealthy backgrounds, who understood the more complex aspects of Tudor navigation. So things like uh, geometry, trigonometry. Uh, below them, you had pers- pursers and quartermasters, and then the regular mariners. Uh, and the regular mariners all had their own specific job within that, but they were also broadly v- really, really talented guys. So uh, although we might think of them as being uneducated, in, uh, academically speaking, in terms of their experience, I mean, they spoke a language, a naval language, that even people on land wouldn't have understood uh, what they were talking about. Uh, And then right down at the bottom there, you have the children. So we think that children from the age of about five or six would have been able to come and work on board the ship, Uh, would have been the son or the nephew of one of the sailors, possibly maybe even an orphan. And there are great advantages to having children that size. When you see the gun deck on the Golden Hind and you need someone to run up and down with uh, shot and gunpowder for you, then um, a five-year-old is pretty much the only person who can do it without uh, knocking themselves unconscious on the way. So many duties of the uh, children were basically running down to the hold and then uh, running up to the gun deck. They were obviously in charge of cleaning, serving food to the officers and uh, things such as this. Uh, So if you're on a long voyage, it's going to be really, really cramped. Uh, The Golden had a crew, the Golden Hind had a crew of about 80 and it slowly filled, of course, with treasure and spices and other goods as they were going around the world. So what little uh, space there was became less and less as the voyage went on. But you can balance this a little bit with the dwindling crew. Uh, So they're being lost to diseases such as dysentery, scurvy. Uh, There's injury, the occasional skirmish, particularly around the coast of South America. And of course, the new exotic, uh, new and exotic diseases as they arrive in the new world. And being in such intimate proximity to each other meant that these diseases were really easily spread despite the best efforts of the barber surgeon and his bloodletting ways. Drake was a stickler for cleanliness on his ships. Punishments were often fines and extra cleaning duties. On top of this, of course, you can add uncertainty. No idea where they're going a lot of the time. Duration of time at sea and the negative psychological effects that come with that. They often run out of fresh water and they'd have to leave the barrels out on the decks with the the tops off just to collect rainwater so they had something to drink. Uh, This occurred fairly fairly early on in their... um, in their circumnavigation and continued to do so as they went around the world. But there was a positive side to all of this as well, of course, which is uh, the camaraderie amongst the men was often really profound. Crews uh, were thought of as families within families. So, for instance, a gun crew would be a small family alongside the other gun crews within the regular family of mariners within the family of the whole crew, like a like a giant kind of uh, nesting doll. Uh, and long periods of sailing, cleaning, repairing, eating, navigating, were punctured, of course, by moments of adrenaline fueled raids on ships and ports, entering places you'd never seen the like of before and tasting exotic foods and being welcomed by exotic cultures who would lay on gigantic spreads for Drake and his crew. And uh, they would swap dancing tips and uh, Drake would often just try and convert them to Protestantism while he was at it. Gosh, that's all amazing. I had never heard that there were children on board. That's incredible. Yeah. Mm. Goodness. Yeah, and no, in terms of, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying it's it, it's fantastic. We obviously we deal a lot with schools, um, mm. and then to be to confront uh, seven and eight year olds with the fact that if they were living in this period, they may well be working aboard a ship like this and uh, probably doing a fairly a fair number of menial and quite horrible tasks. It always goes down very well, particularly with the teachers. We find. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. the, the alternative for a lot of children would be life on land. Yeah. Well, there's, there's obviously plagues and famines and, you know, mass homelessness. Uh, Elizabeth was actually the queen that introduced the workhouse. Uh, and although we think of that as being uh, a bad thing, as it was during Victorian times, when um, Elizabeth introduced it, it was basically to allow people to get fed and to prevent homelessness. So, um, so to go on a ship, get a roof over your head, get fed every day and learn a trade, it's, uh, it's you know, it's probably a better choice than living on land where death is is almost as likely on land as it is at sea. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of the food and supplies, so they were purchasing, obviously, along the way or trading or something like that? 
Uh, yeah, so they left. So when, when the Golden Hind left, we think it had around about 120 or so barrels of food and drink on board. They would have had um, beer and water. Uh, it's a very popular time for beer. It's the highest highest consumption of beer during the entire Tudor period was during Elizabeth's reign. Pretty weak, between 1% and 3%. And on top of that, they would have uh, watered it down uh, in order to make it last longer. And this, of course, had the bonus of the hops in the beer would neutralise any bacteria that was growing in the water. And foods, things such as uh, pork and uh, beef and lamb, they would have been uh, smothered with salt or kept in vinegar in order to preserve them for as long as possible. But essentially, as much as they were motivated by booty, the cast were, the, the, um, the crew were motivated by food and drink, constantly needing to have that to survive. And on top of this, of course, they did have hardtack, which is the, the flour and water biscuit. And it's uh, basically, it's hard baked and you have to rehydrate it. And it lasts, there's a, there's a piece in uh, Elsinore Castle in Denmark, which is over 150 years old and still has no bacteria in it. So oh, it lasts pretty well at sea. It does cause constipation, but apart from that, it's great. <laughs> right, and okay. There's fantastic, and there's just, fantastic sorry. stories of them uh, finding seal colonies or, or, or penguin colonies and um, going out with clubs to collect some fresh oh. meat. So they weren't particularly picky about what they ate. While they were going, going and fighting a seal is, uh, by all accounts, not as easy as it sounds. No, no, I Pretty can vicious. imagine. <laughs> so the eighty crew you mentioned, roughly eighty to begin with, are these all English? No, they wouldn't have all been English. The majority of them would have been, um, but there would have been crew members certainly from the countries immediately surrounding England. So we know that there were a fair number of Welshmen aboard, um, men from Ireland. Uh, there would have been men from France as well. And then as the ship sailed, it would have picked up various members from other ships. So there are periods where there were Spanish sailing aboard with Drake, um, Portuguese uh, ex-slaves as well that were picked up from Portuguese ships. So the makeup of the crew changes a fair amount as, as the voyage goes on. Okay. And so Drake returns home in 1580. What was his welcome like and how did Queen Elizabeth I receive him? Uh, so believe it or not, um, and it can be hard to believe in our age of mass communication, uh, news of Drake's exploits in the Americas or at what actually happened doesn't reach Europe until 1579, um, <laughs> where a correspondence lands on Philip's desk, uh, Philip, King of Spain. Um, you can imagine he's not best pleased. He's not particularly worried about all of the money that he is losing. He's more concerned that there seems to be this growing excitement in England for Drake's successes. Um, and he's worried about copycats. Um, his ambassadors are telling him that there are people in England claiming that they're going to go and do the same thing. And um, so he begins to put a bit of pressure on Elizabeth and her court. And there are members of Eliz the Elizabethan court who are really keen to avoid conflict with Spain in this period and are putting pressure on Elizabeth themselves that when Drake returns that treasure's got to be sent back and the man has got to be punished and she does listen to a certain extent she does listen to these requests uh, she is becoming ever more cautious uh, she doesn't really want all-out conflict with Spain um, she respects and, and, and benefits from their sort of peaceable agreement when Drake first arrives he actually can't come to shore because he arrives in Plymouth and there's a plague uh, so he's not allowed to come come to shore, but he does manage to correspond with Elizabeth. He actually asks a man on the shore whether or not she's still alive. It's one of his first questions. She needs to know whether or not his backer is still alive or whether he's going to be in big trouble. Um, luckily for him, she is. And he rides to London on horseback with a mule train of uh, gold and silver, which obviously catches her eye. The two of them then have a six hour meeting uh, where unfortunately we don't know exactly what happened it's clearly good because drake is given ten thousand um, pounds and a promise that whatever happens to his treasure he's going to be okay he will be rewarded eventually two hundred sixty-four thousand pounds is deposited in the tower of london wow um, and this is not even close to what drake takes we think that he probably gives elizabeth up to £100,000 extra on the sly. There are some reports that suggest that every investor gets a 4,700% return. The most outlandish report, I think, says that the total is something like £600,000 worth of goods. And if you put that into the context of Elizabeth's annual revenue, which was £250,000 at the time, this is a huge windfall for England and for Drake uh, and, and for Drake's crew. 
um, even if it is an exaggeration, you know, it's clearly a really marvellous figure. Um, Drake is brought ever closer into the Elizabethan court. She clearly quite likes him. She clearly thinks that uh, he can be of good service. Um, and he loves this and loves showing off and, and making connections. Uh, and in April of, eight, of 1581, he brings the Golden Hind to London. He sails it down the River Thames to Deptford. Um, and there's a bit of a ceremony where Elizabeth comes aboard the ship. And supposedly the crowds were so large that the small rickety wooden planks that were connecting the land to the ship collapsed and lots of people fell into the mud and it was all very funny. Um, Elizabeth at this point then loses her garter and the French ambassador who's with her has to run and pick it up and she puts it back on and promises it to him as a keepsake after the ceremony is over. So there's clearly an air of jollity about the whole thing. She then raises a sword above her head threatening to chop Drake's head off for being basically a pirate um, and then passes it to the French ambassador and says to him, uh, uh, why don't you knight this man and make him Sir Francis Drake? And this is a big deal at the time. Um, Being knighted as a commoner was fairly uncommon. Um, It would have been noted at home and abroad, this sort of great honour that was bestowed on Francis Drake, who continued to grow and grow in in rank and prestige and throw sort of Gatsby-esque parties aboard the Golden Hind and give out gifts and um, (laughs) and, and move up in the Tudor world. How fabulous. This story just gets better, I think. Goodness. (laughs) So so the ship's now in London, as you said. So, Alan, what happened to the original ship and when was this full-scale reconstruction made? The original ship, I think, originally was about two or three miles down the river from where the new ship is. Uh, in Deptford it was put into dry dock uh, and people came to visit and they would queue for hours and actually interestingly someone remarked to us fairly recently that going to see this ship that had sailed all the way around the world must be like going to the space center now you know seeing this Mm -hmm. amazing thing that's being places that's been places that you can't really comprehend so it was really really popular but then 20 years later we found a report that describes the ship as looking like an emaciated skeleton. So obviously, at some point, uh, public uh, public memory, possibly through a change of monarchy, you know, public memory for that has kind of waned. Um, and we know that by 1662, it pretty much rotted away and was broken up. Uh, and the majority of the wood was believed to be buried in Convoy's Wharf, which is an old Tudor shipyard around there. And uh, they did take some remaining pieces of timber, some of the good timber, And it was made into a chair by a guy called John Davis, who was the keeper of Deptford's naval stores. Uh, And this chair now sits in the Bodleian libraries in Oxford University. Uh, You can visit. You can go in the in the library and look around. There's also one of uh, Sir Christopher Wren's doors right next to it. So you can uh, you can get two for one there. And it has a rather lovely poetic tribute to the ship carved into a tablet hanging from the back of the chair as well. That was written at the time. And it's quite beautiful because it is actually an ode to the ship rather than an ode to uh, to Drake himself. So the current ship was designed by a um, Californian naval architect, a guy called Loring Christian Norgard, and he spent three years meticulously researching the design based on uh, drawings, descriptions of the original Golden Hind and other ships of the period. And he was commissioned by a company that was specially formed, the Golden Hind Limited of San Francisco. And it was a company formed by two guys, Albert Elledge and uh, Art Baum, and they were both guys with uh, deeply uh, invested naval interests. Uh, and as the 400th anniversary of the circumnavigation approached, they wanted to celebrate this great achievement, uh, including his landing in the California area. So uh, the ship was commissioned, it was researched, and it was laid in 1971 at Hinks Boat Yard uh, at Appledore in uh, Devon in the West Country of England, and then uh, completed in 73, and then all the rigging was added, and then she was launched in 1974, after undergoing uh, various local sea trials. Okay, and I had no, before I started sort of kind of doing a bit of reading in preparation to speak with the two of you, I had no idea that this actual, the new ship had also circumnavigated the globe. So Pete, can you tell us a little bit about these voyages? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, fantastically, our our reconstruction mirrors the history of the golden, the original Golden Hind in, in a number of ways. As Alan said, the, the idea was that it was going to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Drake's landing in San Francisco Bay. Uh, most historians now will tell you that it's probably not where he landed, but that's the idea. Um, so it leaves Devon. Um, and amazingly, it, it doesn't have a mothership, it has very, very few mod cons. A lot of the navigation was done in the traditional way. There was um, a man called Christopher Daniels on board who 
who was a uh, expert in Tudor navigation from the museum at Greenwich, um, who did a lot of the work for them. And they, they cross over the Atlantic. They go through the Panama Canal rather than go around the Cape, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, and then they go up to San Francisco. Then the ship stays in San Francisco for a little while after quite a grand welcome. It stays and, and tourists come and have a look. And then eventually it goes over to Japan where it serves as a film set for a little while. Um, and then back through the Indian Ocean, through the Suez Canal, through the Mediterranean, back to back to Scotland um, where it sits and is picked up by its current owner now. Uh, who is captain of it. These voyages in the 80s are a little bit different. Um, they did have a, a mothership for at least part of the journey. And uh, they go over to America, they go to the World Fair in Vancouver, and they go port to port as a sailing museum, come back to the UK and do the same thing here all the way until 1996, uh, where it's invited into London and it sails down the River Thames, sails into dock. Um, where it's been ever since and about two years ago uh, they drained the dock so the golden hind is currently undergoing quite a large-scale repair project um, to sort of restore it to its its former glory and make sure that it lasts another 50 years it's approaching its 50th birthday we're all very excited (laughs) <laughs> that is exciting. And so, you know, you've both obviously spent a long time researching Elizabethan maritime history and you sound extremely enthusiastic about it, which is fantastic. <laughs> so what, and, and you know, both of you can answer this question. What makes this aspect of Tudor history so fascinating for you? So for me, the, the, the whole maritime world in the early modern period is, is fascinating. Uh, I guess on a sort of on a micro level, at a ship level, you have these... Uh, incredible floating communities with their own cultures and economies and and all of which are in dialogue with the structures and cultures on land but which have developed their own unique flavor Um, and you see the development of maritime subcultures with their own rituals and, and, and rules and behaviors and then on a macro level you've got this incredible explosion in global interconnectivity facilitated in many cases by the sea obviously not the first time that different societies around different societies around the world have interacted or influenced each other but the scale of the interaction in the 15th and 16th centuries i think is extraordinary and it does have a number of repercussions not not all of which are positive many historians particularly those in the global north have obviously described this as an age of discovery um, after the fact that europeans for the europeans this was an era of pushing against the frontiers of their understanding uh, whereas other historians have rightly pointed out that for many people in the world, this interconnectivity facilitated forced displacement and slavery and uh, genocide, and so rightly constructed a very different narrative. And I think all of this um, is vital to help us reckon with the global society that we live in today. So for me, I guess it's thinking about voyages like Drake's circumnavigation in terms of scales that I find so interesting. So situating this crew of 60 to 80 men on a tiny ship in the middle of an ocean with their own countercultural set of experiences, uh, which within the context of a global history with which they interact and are shaped and are shaped by. Well, you've convinced me. So that's that's (laughs) fantastic. (laughs) And Alan, what about you? Yeah, I think I think for me, I'm really fascinated. So the lead up to this period to to begin to before the age of exploration were the stories that were going around. So people were inventing these fantastical tales about far distant lands. And that that for me is really fascinating. And the world at the start of the age of exploration must seem must have seemed like a very small place for most people. Uh, Second and third hand tales of the expanding world, enthralling people of tales of adventure. And these true tales follow on the back of outrageous stories of travel from oddly anonymous figures. So people like John Mandeville, there's a famous book called The Travels of Sir John Mandeville. No one knew who he was or even if he was real or ever traveled. There's no record of this guy being knighted. But his book, uh, The Travels of Sir John Mandeville, was an outlandish description of imagined travels. It was an absolute bestseller, Uh, looked at different peoples and cultures and was taken we think probably very seriously by the public and explorers alike. Uh, And it portrays, you know, these foreign lands and there's men with the head of a dog and tribes people with a a giant leg and foot and men with no heads but faces in the middle of their pelvis and all these kind of like crazy inventions. And and, and also um, you had stories arising where sailors would spread uh, rumours of things like flesh-eating birds and boiling waves to deter other explorers from encroaching on their trade routes and territories. I mean, there's the kind of stories that Terry Gilliam would be very proud of. And during the, during the age of exploration, however, public fascination with the stories of raids and battles, 
and the true stories of distant cultures and lands, for me, proves uh, to be as exciting as, if not stranger than <laughs> the fiction that was going around at the time. So the storytelling aspects of, of this, yeah. for me, really, and the culture that grew out of it, the, the reputation that grew out of it, is really fascinating. Okay, now you've mentioned that you run some educational programs there. So tell us about some of these um, programs that you offer. Okay, so obviously people are coming, they come to see the ship. So people bring their schools uh, to us and they get a full interactive tour of the ship. So they get to do things like they use the chip log, which is the tool you use for uh, measuring the speed of a ship. They will turn the capstan to raise the anchor. We'll teach them how to clean and load and fire uh, the cannons and then we have interactive maps and uh, little role play things between Queen Elizabeth and Francis Drake so uh, we tell the story of the Golden Hind and at primary school level obviously it's uh, it's incredibly interactive it's much more fun kids also come on board to learn about pirates so we talk about the golden age of piracy too uh, and also we do overnight living history programs so we have like school groups and scout groups that will come in and they will meet three of the characters and they'll be trained up on all these different things. And then they will sleep on the gun deck overnight uh, wow. and then get up and have breakfast and be thrust blinking into the light of uh, modern day <laughs> London first thing in the morning. So those are the younger programs that we offer. Um, and then, you know, we, we also target specifically the, um, the GCSE curriculums that, that we have here over here in the UK, looking at the Spanish Armada, uh, looking at Drake as part of a network of explorers and exploration that was happening at the time, um, and try and get students to wrestle with kind of big historical questions, but using the ship as a, as a source of information. So how can we look at people's lived experience, what it was like on the gun deck, what it was like down in the hold, and use that to colour our historical understanding of, of these sort of galumphing historical events? Wow, those programs sound fantastic. And so, and then other individual members of the public can come on board, obviously, and tour the ship as well. Absolutely. And, and on every weekend, we run um, programs specifically for the public. And these kind of operate like a carousel. The ship is populated by costumed members of the crew, each who have a role, give short talks about their role um, and get the public involved as well. So there's lots here to do if you're, if you, if you're just a visitor um, or you bring a school or Sounds great. It's, const it's constantly remarked upon that it's the uh, it's the best way to spend your money in London. <laughs> the very best. The very, oh, very I'm best. sure it is. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think you two are not only knowledgeable, but you sound like a lot of fun. That's the sense I'm getting. So that, that sounds really good. <laughs> That's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, I can't let you go off to work just yet. There's a few more things we need to do. So at the end of our episodes of Talking Tudors, we always play with our guests a little game of what I call 10 to go. So they're basically just 10 questions just to get to know the guest a little bit better. So I'm going to divide them up and, and do five each, if that's all right with you. Fantastic. All right. So let's start. So, Pete, what was the last film that you watched? The last film that I watched? Oh, God, that's different tricky. I watched oh, 1917, oh. Um, the New World War I uh, film, which was fantastic. Yes, that's on my list. I'm ho hoping to watch that in the next week, actually. Yeah. Um, Alan, what's an inspirational place to visit for you that's close to home? Well, I'm obviously a little bit of a museum person. I have <laughs> to say, if you have already visited the Golden Hind, then I highly recommend for your second choice that you should go to the Imperial War Museum. Uh, the Imperial War Museum's in uh, Lambeth in South London. It's just a fantastic place. It's a beautiful museum uh, and their range of artefacts is bewildering and their, um, their specialist exhibitions are always really thoughtful, uh, really well laid out. It's a brilliant place. I love it. And the staff there are incredible. That sounds good. I haven't been there because I normally tend to stick to, you know, everything Tudor and medieval. When I'm sure, in London, sure. But I'll um, add that well, to I, the I list. recommend it. It's a great place, great place. All right. Um, so, Pete, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> I wanted to be a falconer. Um, oh. So <laughs> I went to a, uh, a castle with uh, my mum and dad when I must have been about eight. And they had this guy doing uh, falconry displays. Um, and giving talks about the history and, and, and flying the, the birds. Um, and I just absolutely loved it. And for a good three years, I was really obsessed with doing it. And my parents actually came to the ship the other day, one of the days when I was costumed and giving talks. And my mum did say to me, she said, this isn't that far away. 
from what you wanted to do when you were six. Um, all you need is a bird of prey. So I'm working, I'm working on that. I'm working on that. Have you had a go? Have you have you done it anywhere? Not since I was a child. So when I was a child, obviously, you can take part in these displays and um, and they let you hold an owl or something. I've not <laughs> never done it professionally. I, I'm not sure it's my calling any longer. Okay. Um, but but we'll, we'll see. You never know. Yeah, you know exactly. All right, Alan, what's a favourite holiday destination for you? No, I am um, well, my favourite. I used to go travelling quite a lot. And uh, I would say my favourite country in the world is probably New Zealand. Uh, it's very, very relaxed. It's unbelievably beautiful. Uh, and the only way I can describe it to English people that haven't been there is it's kind of like the more beautiful countryside aspects of England, only more so. Uh, that, and that's really hard. That's a really hard thing to grasp. But it's incredibly beautiful. And the people are amazing, really friendly, really relaxed. I hitchhiked my way uh, all the way around uh, the North Island of New Zealand. And it was it was an amazing experience. Not at any point did I feel I was going to be murdered. No, no, they're, they're such beautiful people. And I won't yeah. hold it against you that you said New Zealand, not Australia. That's perfectly fine. Well, I've, I've, I've been to Western Australia and I, I was only there for five days, unfortunately. But Western Australia is also staggeringly beautiful. Uh, yeah, I really, really loved it. I was down in Margaret River. Oh, uh, lovely. Good wine there, there as well. As well. <laughs> wine, well, that's what I was there for. I was, I've been sent there on a wine course by a company I was working for back in the day. Fabulous. All right, Pete, what was your first paid job? I used to teach younger children theatre um, drama on a Saturday. So when I was much younger, I used to go to a theatre, uh, a Saturday theatre class for all different ages and as I got older, I then started to work work doing that. And Alan, what's a favourite childhood memory of yours? Oh, that's... Can I be really boring and say I really remember going to the Imperial War Museum? <laughs> <laughs> you really like the Imperial actually, War Museum. <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my, um, my older brother, he was at university down in Bristol. And um, when he was there, he was volunteering at weekends when they were fixing the SS Great Britain, and I remember being taken around this sort of building site of this old steamship, and it uh, really was incredibly uh, impactful. I can still smell it. I can still hear the sounds of the of the men at work, and that's not just because those men are also working on our ship now. So it's it, that really, really is an incredibly vivid memory for that. That and uh, when we moved house when I was three, my mum throwing away my Andy Pandy toy which I was furious <laughs> about and still haven't forgiven her. Oh, dear. Okay. So, Pete, what's something that you're looking forward to this year? The summer. <laughs> it, it, we're in the depth of winter uh, over here now, and obviously a lot of the time we work outside. And it's all part of the experience, but it can become quite cold. So I'm looking forward to arriving at work in the sunshine, leaving work in the sunshine and not being cold. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet think. you are. <laughs> All right. And Alan, what's a new skill that you'd like to learn? Oh, I'm quite keen to learn archery. Uh, but one yeah. thing we're doing at the moment is we are looking at clearing the dry dock in order to introduce some uh, Tudor era uh, shipbuilding techniques. So bringing in pole lathes and things like that. And I'm really, really curious to learn all of those things. So uh, hopefully, if we get that going, the staff will be learning how to do that for free, I'm hoping. Yeah, that sounds like fun. I had a go at um, Hever Castle one year, and apparently I was a natural. So, you know, I can I can give you some tips when I see you. There you, there you go. Maybe you can be one of the teachers, Natalie. <laughs> well, exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's my <laughs> resume. All right. Now, Pete, so when it comes to Tudor history, actually, I'm going to ask both of you this question. When it comes to Tudor history, there's so much that still obviously remains unknown and undiscovered. What's a discovery that you'd really love to make? So every or at the end of almost every single program we do a child will ask the question what happened to francis drake and do we have any of his treasure uh francis drake was put so the story goes put into a lead coffin with a few of his possessions and thrown over the side of the ship after he died um no one has ever found this lead coffin and the supposed treasure that lies therein um and that would be good. Uh, that would make fame and fortune, I think. <laughs> I, uh, treading in Drake's footsteps. <laughs> Love it. Fabulous. And Alan, what about you? So I think 
for me, so a lot of the records that Drake kept, so his diaries and his paintings were locked away in the tower um, and then a mysterious fire destroyed <laughs> destroyed lots of his paintings. And if I could get my hand on Francis Drake's diary, that would make me so happy because there's a there's a book called, um, oh my word, I forgot the name of it. The World Encompassed. Thank you, The World Encompassed, that was supposedly written by Drake but was written by the, the ship chaplain Francis Fletcher, who fell foul of Drake at one point, and then was revised by Drake's nephew a few years later. So it's gone through uh, quite a lot of different stages. So and a, there's very little that actually describes the parts of the, the circumnavigation that are the details I want to know. So to be able to get my hands on Drake's personal diary would be phenomenal but they were they were shoved away so that the uh so that the spanish couldn't find out the truth of what drake did okay well fingers crossed i've got my fingers crossed for both of you, you never <laughs> know what's gonna you know in some stately home behind a wardrobe or you know all those sorts Who of knows? stories that come to life Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, now there's one more thing that we have to do and that's the tutor takeaway so i always ask my guests for a tutor takeaway so something for our listeners to go and check out after the episode it might be a book to read a film to watch a song to listen to do you have a tutor takeaway um, so I am, I'm torn between two. So there's a great book by John Sugden called uh, Sir Francis Drake. It was written in 2008 and it's pretty comprehensive. And I think for me, it's the first really balanced book about Drake that I read before. It was all sort of slight tinges of uh, nationalism in a lot of books about him that I'd read. But uh, the, the book for me that's really been inspiring since I started working here is a book by a guy called Ian Mortimer. And it's called The Time Traveller's Guide to Elizabethan England. Uh, it's bewilderingly well researched and a really, really fun, accessible read. And as well as a great overview, there's lo- lots of lovely little sort of facts in it as well that are always fun to sort of put out into the middle of programmes when we're doing them as well. So that's my highest recommendation. For me, I think it's got to be Jerry Broughton has a book called This Orientile, uh, which looks at the interconnectivity between the Elizabethan court and the Islamic world. Um, in this period, which I think, you know, is obviously very politically pertinent at the moment, but is also just incredibly fascinating in its own white right and looking at the way that these cultures were interacting um, and influencing each other uh, in terms of their art and their culture and their politics. Really, really brilliant. Highly recommend. That sounds good. And do you know what? I think that somebody just yesterday posted a picture of that book or or one on the same sort of theme in our Talking Tutors Facebook group. So that's I think that's a sign that I need to go and find Fantastic. that book. <laughs> I do recommend it. Disorientile is great. All right, great. Now, thank you both so much for taking the time out of your day to talk tutors with you. It's been fabulous. And I look forward to chatting with you when I'm in London later on in the year. Oh, well, thank you very much for, for welcoming us uh, welcoming us on the podcast. Yes, thanks, Natalie. It's been, it's been loads of fun. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon.